Hello, everyone. Welcome to our ninth edition of Brazil Korea Entrepreneurship Lecture Series. My name is Sujong Ko. I'm the founder of this uh, project that I started in 2016 in the middle of a, a political economic crisis in Brazil in order to support the entrepreneurs. Uh, I am originally from uh, South Korean. Have, uh, I've been living here in Brazil for more than 20 years. So uh, it is my nature to be passionate about Brazil and South Korea relations. So welcome again to our ninth edition Brazil Korea Entrepreneurship Lecture Series. Today we have many uh, experts from various areas to share their knowledge with us. We have an opening, three panels, uh, food and beverage, fashion, entertainment, entrepreneurship, innovation, investors. And finally, we have the closing. Uh, our event uh, uh, will be finished uh, uh, before uh, 10 30 p.m. Sao Paulo time. So uh, thank you again for your patience because this event is going to be very intense in content. But the good thing is that we are going to record this and share with everybody that um, was not able to attend this event today. But our mission is to spread out this uh, amazing knowledge on Brazil Korea relations. So I would like to give my thank words to a few companies that supported us. First of all, uh, this event is for, for the first time. This is being organized by the Korean newspaper in Brazil. Bungjia uh, News, Nachim. We have the sponsorship from BR Visa, represented by Marta here. Fuxuaran Camerini, uh, New York law firm. Kebi Hana, uh, the Korean bank in Brazil. I also uh, would like to give my thank words to the various institutional supports and also the business partners that helped us to promote this event. So this event is being recorded. So if you are not, uh, if you do not want to be on the video, please just to turn it off. And also I ask everybody to uh, keep the microphone mute. So let's start. First, we have uh, the representative from the embassy, Brazilian embassy in Korea. Then I'm going to ask uh, uh, Marta Michiko from BR Visa and David Camerini from Fox Horan and uh, Yuri from Kebihana uh, to celebrate our event. So let's start with the Thiago Matus Moreira, technical advisor in the trade promotion of the Brazilian embassy in Seoul, South Korea. Hello, everyone. Hello, Sue. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to this event. It's the second time around we are here representing the embassy and uh, creating this space for more time to talk with all the businessmen interested in this relation between Korea and Brazil. Unfortunately, uh, João Marcelo Montenegro Pires, the head of the sector, was unable to come, so I'll be representing him uh, today. And I'll give a little presentation about the current situation of Brazil and Korea trade affairs. Uh, I hope uh, there are interesting questions that come from this presentation and that will be able to uh, develop even further the Korean and Brazil relations in the trade and investment sector. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm here for everyone's service. By the way, Thiago, see you soon. We see have you, soon. you on the, yeah, in the Next very panel. first panel, exactly. OK, so in sequence, I would like to invite Marta Michiko, founder of BR Visa, from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good evening. It's a great honor for BR Visa to support this initiative of commercial, business, and the cultural promotion between Brazil and Korea. BR Visa is a global mobility consultant, must be a part of this entire process of bringing Brazil and Korea closer together. That is why we are here. That's why we support our and formal ambassador Su Jun Ko, who has made us admire Korea, its culture, its food, 
its fashion, its music, its technology, its art. Moreover, presented opportunity to do business in Korea. Thank you, Su, for the opportunity. I look forward to hearing the panels with such a diverse program. I wish an excellent event and thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much, Marta. In sequence, we have David Camerini, managing partner of Foxu Horan and Camerini, New York City, United States. Welcome, good afternoon and good evening. David. Uh, thank you, Sue. Thank you, Sue. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank the other sponsors and the corporate uh, partners who uh, were kind enough to put this together. Here we are at another auspicious and timely event that uh, Sue Jean and all of us have put together for the listeners and the watchers around the globe. I think it's very, very important to continue to work for and foment the ongoing relationship between Brazil and South Korea in many different areas and many different sectors of industry. Uh, these are two huge economies that have a lot to offer the world and have a lot to offer each other. It's, uh, it's only the beginning. Uh, there's so much to do. Um, I think these, these lecture series are a great way to start. If, uh, if obviously, if you need more information, I would urge you to reach out and contact the different speakers here and the different organizations and get more information. Don't miss out. There are lots of opportunities for everybody in the in the globe, honestly, because although the, the discussions are between between Brazilian and uh, Korean interested parties, what they come together and build uh, companies that they uh, explore uh, industries that they grow is something that uh, the rest of the world can also participate in and gain some value, some advantage from. So if you ever need anything from us in New York, we have been working in Latin America for over 54 years and work very closely with our friends in Brazil, Korea, rest of Asia, and rest of Latin America. And uh, with that, I pass it on to the next uh, sponsor here. Thank you, Sue, for putting this together. Thank you, David. Uh, so, in sequence, we uh, have uh, Yuri Armelli de Oliveira, Head of a Project and New Business from Gabi Hana. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Sue. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yuri. I'm Head of, uh, as, as Sue just said, Product and Project at Gabi Hana. On behalf of the bank, I congratulate Ms. Sue Junko for organizing the ninth edition of Brazil Korea Entrepreneurship Lecture Series. Her ability to cure up-to-date and relevant content is admirable. Uh, the effort on bringing network from South Korea and Koreans in Brazil to support even more the growth of this project is remarkable. Thank you, Mr. Su Junko. My compliments as also to all volunteers, sponsors, supporters, partners and panelists who actively contribute to the growth and development of this fantastic entrepreneur ecosystem created around Brazil-Korea relations. Congratulations for you your support and uh, initiative. I would also like to point out that Kebi Hana, in addition to sponsoring this ninth edition of uh, Brazil Korea Entrepreneurship Lecture Series, has a wide range of products and services that can facilitate the mission of connecting Brazil Korea and empower the entrepreneurs and the related ecosystem. Uh, I invite everyone to know better about Kebi Hana Brazil and share your challenges with us. We can and we will certainly help you entrepreneurs on finding the ideal financial solution to address the issues that your business may face regarding the Brazil Korea environment. Without further, I wish you all a great event that uh, we all have a night full of new thoughts and lots of great sharings. Good night. Thank you, Yuri. So with this, we uh, finished the opening. So now let's start our uh, very first panel one in food and beverage. Um, uh, we have the moderator, Gabriel Prado de Bavos. He's a representative of Montes Plant Food Company Brazil from Mato Grosso, Brazil. So before we start the panel one, uh, I would like to say my thank words to everyone at the opening. So um, good luck, everybody, to this event, panel one, two, three. So and let's be patient because it's going to be very intense in content. So Gabriel, you are. Uh, you have the floor. Let's start. Okay, Sue. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. 
first of all, one more time, thank you, Sue, for this event. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for entrepreneurs in several areas to expose their ideas, business, and work. As Sue said, I'm Gabriel Prado de Barros. I come from Cuiabá, Mato Grosso. I came from a family of ranchers in Mato Grosso. But now I'm working for this company. I represent this company called Mounts Planting Food. Um, it's a company from Kentucky, uh, United States. We work mainly in soil health, building better structure for organic matter in the soil and help growers all over the world for this new sustainable area for agriculture. That being said, I'd like to introduce to you guys uh, the four panelists that we have today for the food and beverage topic. Uh, the first one is Vitor Melon. Vitor is an uh, international, internationalist and administrator. He's an uh, executive director of the Master Inc. Group, where he works in the areas of market intelligence, digital transformation, international trade and marketing in different industries. Also, he participated in missions in over 20 countries and lived between 2014 to 2016 in China. He will cover Brazilian food, and beverage brand building when going global. Um, also, we have Thiago Matos, Mr. Thiago Matos. He's a technical advisor at the Trade Promotion Office at the Embassy of Brazil in Seoul. I think he introduced himself early in the panel here. He will do a presentation on the current state of the Brazil-Korea trade balance and the most recent activity carried out by the embassy to promote trade and investment. Also, we have Ms. Julia Mazocchi. She's a digital marketing expert consulting from Milan, Italy. Today, she will talk about digital marketing essentials to build the right strategy to enter in the market. And the last but not the least, we have Mr. Ju. Uh, he's a sales manager at Seara Korea a company from GBS Group. I think all the Brazilians know very well GBS Group. You are familiar with this in Seoul, Korea. He will cover the Korean meat and the opportunity for the Brazilian meat. Hopefully, you guys will enjoy the panel. Let's start with Victor Melo. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to express my gratitude to Ms. Sue. I think it's very inspiring for a uh, event to support entrepreneurship being uh, managed by such inspiring, versatile entrepreneur as you are. And also, thank you very much for the sponsors to, to help make this happen. I will share my screen and guide you through. Okay, I hope everyone is able to see my screen. So my topic today uh, is to explore some, some cases of uh, Brazilian food and beverage industries uh, doing brand building when going global. Um, well, I've, I've been uh, introduced already by uh, Gabriel, uh, but here is a short profile. I think he covered most of the points, um, just to, to comment about this Ali Brave project. It's a project that we have uh, with Alibaba.com, where we manage uh, online stores for Brazilian suppliers in the marketplace. Uh, so I invite you to get to know. I'm also founder of ADUS Institute, uh, NGO that supports refugees in Brazil to get integrated. So if you are into philanthropy, I also invite you to get to know more about ADUS. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind when talking about uh, Brazilian exports of food and beverage that we need to differentiate uh, the basic food and the elaborated food. So the different stages of the manufacturing process has more value added, uh, more complex is to develop exports. And Brazil is uh, historically a big uh, commodities exporter. And the food and beverage industries has been uh, improving over time. This uh, chart shows the composition according to uh, an index that uh, separates the 
uh, HS codes, so the the codes used to to make foreign trade. So you can we can have an idea that uh, most of the production that is exported is uh, basic food. Here we have another chart that shows this uh, how it's changing over time uh, since 1997. Um, so when we get to the let's say the mid 2000s, we have a, a big uh, increase in the basic food exports, and this keeps going on and on, up and up uh, as time goes by. Uh, and for the elaborated food, we have uh, ups and downs, and, and uh, if compared to the same volume uh, of the basic food, we have a more stable uh, curve. Um, here, uh, now bringing some uh, insights about the exports to South Korea, I think the Tiago's presentation will uh, cover this in, in deep details. But this shows uh, only for the food exports, so I have not considered here beverages. This is a different index for grouping the, the sectors. Um, and this shows how the food, uh, manufactured food, are being exported. Uh, so the blue bars are showing this increase over time. And the orange line shows the share that uh, South Korea has in, in this uh, product export. So the South Korea share is uh, going up. And this shows the importance of this uh, partnership. So it's still small uh, if compared to the potential that the commerce um, both countries can develop. Um, more recently, I also extracted some data about the uh, manufactured foods that Brazil has been exporting to South Korea and the ones that are growing the most in this pandemic years. So we have some uh, good news, despite some still having a uh, small volume. We have a, a very positive variation in this period. And I call the attention for bread, cakes and cookies. Uh, so we have this huge number here for the percentage because uh, we still have small numbers. So this uh, means that in the past we did not or only have a, a few uh, exports. And distilled beverages is another uh, sector. Other coffee products, so this does not, do not include uh, roasted coffee. Um, so basically are products that use coffee in the composition. Uh, we'll have a lot of uh, presentations talking about beef and uh, pork meat. These uh, are huge sectors in Brazil. Brazil is a market leader uh, in these sectors and this has been developing quite well in South Korea. We have some uh, sectors re related to juices and uh, other derived uh, from fruit and plant products. Uh, this is also increasing. And fat and vegetable oil, also uh, this one of the top sectors that Brazil has been exporting to South Korea. This chart here shows the potential. So this ITC, the International Trade Center, uh, has a tool that explores uh, the potential. So the dark color shows the actual exports and the light color shows the potential to be developed. So we saw in the last slide that Brazil uh, has been now exporting more uh, alcoholic beverages. But according to the ITC, this is uh, basically all the potential being already developed. But we believe this is only one tool, an idea to have reference. We have many others. Apex in Brazil also has a very similar one. But I think here the learning is to look for those sectors that uh, 
we have a huge gap of potential and think not only about the the isolated products but also derived products so when you talk about juices why not think about many other fruit juices that we have in brazil we see that some some fresh fruits uh, or dried fruits are also developing like guavas for example brazil nut is really appreciated in south korea and uh, some food preparations uh, we also work in this sector and uh, convenience and healthy food is being more and more demanded so we have a lot of potentials to develop in south korea and when uh, we talk about brand building we have many details to think about as we historically has been developing more agricultural and commodity sector when we come to the industry it's very rare among uh, small and medium industries in brazil that the companies we are most used to to cover all those dimensions so how to think about the image and reputation in the target market or how to develop strategies offline and online in this market and uh, do the industry here in brazil knows uh, very precisely how the competitors works in this market um, how to measure brand awareness as soon as you, you make investments both on online and offline channels and also the brand distribution this chart is more focused on online but we have much more details to explore when thinking about international expansion. Um, these are basically the methods that we have been using. This project is about uh, selecting the most relevant markets for the company and then uh, approach to this market in a very uh, structured way this is a bigger project where uh, we have uh, a, an operation to be structured in that market so it, it's more developed we can think about not only export but uh, to 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 bring other international expansion models so this is also a, let's say a mid-term uh, project and more recently, we have been achieving great results using the online channel. Uh, I think this uh, channel has a lot to, to help Brazilian industries in small and medium sizes, uh, because some of these marketplaces, uh, it projects the, the branding to the whole world. And uh, instead of, uh, identifying the biggest potential markets and then making a very focused work you basically project your brand and your products to the whole world and you can also customize it a lot so alibaba.com is one of them we also have been working with range me uh, it's a startup that was acquired by ecrm group in the us and now they recently expanded to Canada, to Australia, New Zealand, UK, and Netherlands. So it's a very interesting marketplace as well. And trading in the UAE. We hope to get to know more about uh, South Korean marketplaces, maybe in another opportunity. These are the brands that we have been working with, uh, Acai Verão, Acai is a very interesting product that many countries still don't know, while some others uh, are crazy about it. Uh, it's a very unique product from Brazil, and we currently do not have competitors. Bifum, rice, making rice noodle vermicelli, stock Brazil, alcoholic uh, beverages and syrups. Uh, mineral water from Minerali, Organic is uh, natural energy drinks, uh, whisk coffees and Vapsa, it's also uh, pre-cooked food. A little bit more about our group and being invited to get to know more about us. And I hope I brought some, some interesting information for us to reflect. And um, if you have any doubts, please count on me.
Thank you, Vitor. Thank you. Uh, let's pass the word to Mr. Thiago Matos. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes, Thiago, you're here. People are on mute, but we can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Is my presentation on the screen? Yes. OK. Hello, everyone. My name is Thiago Matos. I'm speaking here from Seoul, South Korea, and I've been working for the Trade Promotion Department of the Embassy for the last four years. So this presentation is going to be more like an invitation for all the Brazilian businesses who might be in the audience to um, to seek for us if they wanted, if, you, if they are in the needs of entering South Korea market. Uh, we are here to help you. And I would like to begin by showing this picture of the embassy. This is actually where, where I work, but it's also a place where every single Brazilian business person who is interested in exposing their products or maybe organizing an event on a near future where uh, international travel is easier, is fully welcome to come here free of cost and, and organize events, do the presentation, have a big uh, showroom that is 100% free for Brazilian businesses. Uh, it's in a very well located uh, space in the city of Seoul, close back to the Kyombokum Palace for those of you who might have visited. And uh, it's also uh, it's your home here in Korea for for promoting your businesses in this country. So just to begin with, I would like just to point out some historical facts to uh, tell the story of the Brazil-Korea trade relations. The diplomatic relations were uh, set they were established in 1959, and our embassy opened in 1962. And of course, and ever since, the relationship between Brazil and Korea has just been grown with by like cultural ties, by migration. But above all, the most discerning feature of Brazil and Korea uh, relationship is by far trade. In 2018, Korea became uh, Brazil's second biggest partner in Asia uh, in terms of trade flow. Uh, Surpassing even Japan, which, uh, as many Brazilians might know in the audience, was a traditional partner uh, to to uh, Brazil in Asia, it still is. But like Korea assumed the second position mostly because of the huge import flow that uh, Korea has with Brazil. Uh, Brazil by a lot of um, mechanical parts, by cell phone pieces, by um, other. Uh, Industrial projects that Korea products that Korea develop, but also on the other way around, and I'm going to uh, enter on the topic uh, just now. This is uh, just as a very uh, wide overview of how what the current state of trade between Brazil and Korea is today, uh, from the last trimester. Uh, those are the the most recent data. For, uh, for into 2021, and I think that's the most uh, striking feature of the of this data, Brazil for the first time in history had a surplus of trade with Korea. I was just telling you that like the the trading flow was quite unbalanced on the Korean side. Uh, in 2021, for the first time, Brazil actually exported more to Korea than Korea to Brazil. There are a couple of reasons for that. One of them is because of the current uh, situation, economic situation in Brazil. Uh, the uh, purchase, power, purchase power has been lowered, but it also has to do with Brazil, great, uh, a great development on Brazil export numbers to Korea, especially in terms of commodities. Uh, but as of today, Brazil is, uh, is the seventh uh, is the largest destination for Brazilian exports is, is uh, Korea. And the, and the other way around is the eighth largest orange of Brazilian imports is, uh, is Brazil. So they are by far uh, central partners when you're thinking about uh, Brazil role in trade in Asia and in the world in general. But what exactly are the products that constitute this relationship? Uh, here is just like a very graphic snapshot of it. As you might see, like the 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 topic of of this uh, of this current uh, panel is food and beverages. You can see the agro products, they take roughly 50% uh, of all the export products we have uh, from Brazil to Korea. And most notably soybeans, of course, the usual suspects, corn. But uh, uh, most notably as well, especially for the Koreans who might be in the audience, 
a lot of uh, poultry meat. Brazil is the biggest poultry meat uh, exported to Korea in the whole country. Also coffee, even though it only represents 2% of our exports to the country, Brazil is the top exporter of coffee to Korea for ever since uh, the early 20s, oh, the early, uh, early 2000s, sorry. And it has been being so like a close competition with Colombia, but always uh, ranked first. Um, core, but like mostly very attached to commodities, which is good. We are happy for that. But like uh, the work they develop in the embassy normally tends to fo focus on like smaller um, producers. And in that sense, uh, we also want to diversify the products we offer in Korea to be more industrialized. So we are very interested in working with like possible projects that uh, are related to food, but they are, as our, my previous, my, the previous presentation mentioned, more complex and, and more industrial for the Korean public to be more complex. And just briefly mentioning the other way around, as you might imagine, Korean exports to Brazil, they, they tend to be uh, uh, almost 100% industrial. Uh, a lot of parts and, and uh, of course, el electronic uh, products, uh, television, fridges, cell phones, automobiles. Um, just as a, an interesting uh, thing to notice, uh, there's been a huge raise in the me medicine, medical and pharmaceutical products from Korea to Brazil. And that, that, that of course, is related uh, a little bit with uh, the corona situation where Korea started to uh, sent to Brazil a lot of pharmaceutical products, products related to that sphere, but also if the aesthetical uh, Hallyu wave of like more and more Brazilians are more interested in consuming um, medical products related to anti-aging and um, and the beauty aspect of this industry, it's also has been on the rise. It usually didn't represent more than one or two percent. Now you're nearly at five percent of all the Korea exports to Korea are inside that field, which is interesting for the, maybe not so much for me, but for other people in the audience as well. Um, so entry more specifically about the work that we do at the embassy. The, I just wanted to give like a very brief overview of uh, the companies we have supported in the past. They, as you can see, they uh, range from very different sizes. Uh, they are from big companies uh, as GBS here, who is also represented. Uh, from uh, tiny coffee exporters, we help from coffee to airplanes, from the sandals to uh, to candy. Um, that is to say that, like, regardless of the type of your business that you might might have in Brazil, and if you're interested in entering Korean market, talk to us, and we might be able to help you to uh, to promote your product here and to uh, connect you with Korean buyers. This is what the embassy is here for. And we would like to have a, we would love to have an email from you in that regard. Just roughly uh, talking about some of the main challenges that most of the of the business people who come to us uh, face when trying to enter the Korean market. Uh, as mentioned before, Korea has a lot of potential for Brazilian products, but there are some uh, aspects that are almost like impossible to to go around when entering this market. The first of them is then is the biggest complaint, and as of now, we just we just can wait about it. Is the tariff barriers? Uh, Korea famously has signed a lot of FTAs with many countries that are direct competitors, uh, namely U.S., uh, Chile, European Union. So many of the products that Brazil is big in other uh, in other uh, markets, it's not as much representative on the on the on numbers in terms of export numbers to Korea. And uh, right now, um, Mercosur Korea uh, agreement is a reality. They are actually uh, negotiating it. And then we don't have a specific time frame on when it's going to be finalized. But many products where Brazil is competitive in other markets, such as orange juice, as mentioned in the other presentation, uh, simply became um, almost impossible to compete in the Korean market. Uh, the Brazilian orange juice was big in the 80s here, uh, which was like a, the, the top leader on the market. But as soon as the US FTA, uh, the US FTA with Korea was signed, it simply disappeared from the shelves because the, the taxation was too, too, too high. So in some cases, it, it almost becomes almost impossible, but we might help 
uh, you to try to find a ways uh, viability of your product here based on the, the current tax situation of your of your of your products in Korea. Second is regulatory and phytosanitary barriers. There are many agro products, food products in, uh, from Brazil that uh, as of now are not allowed to enter in the Korean market. The, the pork meat, for example, which was only allowed to enter in the Korean market in 2018. Uh, before that, and even so, only from the city of Santa Catarina. So uh, there are similar products, uh, especially on the meat department, who are still in a very slow process of uh, being accepted by Korean authorities to the market. Maybe Mr. Joe later is going to talk uh, in more detail about it, but it's, it's, it's a constant for especially on the food sector. Uh, also, a general lack of knowledge of the market. Korea is very far and like not many Korean Brazilian businesses know, don't fully understand how the Korean market works that the actual size of the market many of them are, are they, they bring their experience from china or japan and try to apply directly here and that's not always the case and of course uh difficulties in tracking local partners especially during the pandemic has become very hard to to meet uh interested new parties to uh to import brazilian products we hope with next year the fairs are back and some of you might be able to come and visit us and participate in food ex or other uh, food events. But like finding an interested and committed Korean partner can be a, a, a can be difficult, and we are we'd like uh, to help you uh, in that process. And how do we help you? Like here, I just pointed out some of the activities we've been carrying on from the last few years. We support on trade fairs. Uh, either like being there and presenting the, your company or or multiple companies in events such as uh, the cafe show, which is the biggest coffee show in the event in Korea who's happening that is happening uh, next month. The Foodex food fair, which is the biggest uh, food and beverage fair that happens every year in Korea, which we are every year present there, uh, either cooperation with the Ministry of Agriculture or uh, Apex. We do promotional events, uh, one like of products of interest for the Korean market, like uh, meat. Uh, we've done like a big event promoting Brazilian chicken and Brazilian pork in Korea, as well for coffee to raise awareness of the Brazilian product here. And of course, doing online and offline, offline business meeting. Uh, we have those virtual and offline events when possible, where we connect Brazilian and Korean businesses who might be interested in cooperating and put them on the, on the same room and allow them to negotiate and, and give support either by translation services or, or anything they might need. Just to give a more recent and concrete example, we just had a big one uh, last month where 12 Brazilian companies uh, were selected to, to be on a, a business matchmaking session where they connected with some of the biggest players in the Korean market, namely the SPC Group, CG Freshway, Emart, uh, which uh, the, the GS, GS uh, Retail, all big players in the Korean food and beverage market. And, and the, uh, all those Brazilian companies all had a chance to sit with those companies and uh, pitch their products and and see how they would be actually be able to get to the Korean consumer, which was a a big development for us. We hope to be hosting another one of those uh, in early next year. So please follow our social media to know about the how to subscribe to those events and how to participate. But just in conclusion, I think I already uh, used all my time. I'd like to thank you for listening to this presentation and invite you to send us an email if you have any questions about the work of Sakon and like our about the Korean market in general. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thiago. Thank you, Thiago. It's a very good presentation. I'm very impressed with the work that you do for our country. As a Brazilian, I have to say that we really appreciate it. And as an entrepreneur, I think it's uh, very important the work that you're doing. So the next one in our panel, I would like to pass the word to Miss Julia Mazocchi. Please, Julia, um, uh, introduce yourself and, and make your presentation for us, please. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Julia. Uh, I'm speaking today from Milan, Italy. Um, it's now 1.46 a.m., so way past my bedtime, but I'm going to try to go through this presentation as well as I can. 
Um, let me just share my screen a little bit. Okay, so today we're gonna be talking about the digital marketing essentials to build the right entry strategy and that not being entering a new product category or a sector, we're focusing today on how to enter a new market. Um, I try to structure this presentation today in the best way possible um, to convey my message. Of course, we have limited time, so there are certain things that I could focus on. Um, I'm gonna start to give. I'm gonna start by giving you a little introduction about me, and then I'm gonna dive into our topic, starting by telling you some tips about how to find the right market to enter, and then following up with some digital marketing strategies that you can put into place to succeed in that chosen market. So a little bit about me. I've been working in the digital marketing field for a while. Um, I've had experience in the UK, China, in Brazil, where I was born and raised, and recently Milan, Italy, where I'm living and working now. Um, I work with clients in different sectors, B2C and B2B. My main goal is to always uh, connect their customers to the company as much as possible. Um, I work as well with clients in the food and beverage industry, which right now uh, digital marketing has become highly relevant, especially producers, distributors, and restaurants as well. Um, so finding the right market to enter is the first step before building any level of strategy. Uh, there's two ways that usually companies go into it. The first way is that they already have an idea of a market that they want to enter based on their internal research, based on some inquiries that they may be having from customers from different locations, or even based on a bit of traffic that your website is gaining from a specific location. Or there is the second type of company that has no idea which market to enter, and wants to find out. Now, there are a lot of digital tools online that can really help you make the decision and find the right market to enter um, to back up your internal data. One of the tools that I like to use that I want to introduce you to a little bit is Google Market Finder. And what's interesting about this tool is that it gives you really important data on specific points that are highly relevant to take into consideration when entering a new market, such as household disposable income, ease of doing business in that location, monthly search volumes, and the cost of advertising. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to be focusing on the monthly search volumes and cost of advertising because the other two are pretty self-explanatory. So monthly search volumes indicates the the estimated demand that you have for the product. So how much people, how, how many people are searching for your product category or for your services on search engines and the cost of advertising as well, that it really indicates the level of competition that you have in that country. So if your cost of advertising to enter South Korea is too high, it means there is a lot of competition. If your cost of advertising is low, there is less competition and, and it can be a more interesting market for you to enter. Uh, I'm going to show you just a, a little example of how this tool would work. So if you're a coffee producer in Brazil and you want to en enter a different market, you select a few categories that your company fa falls into and it's going to give you the best markets to enter. Now, taking in into consideration that the majority of cases, you're going to have U.S. as your top one market to enter. And... That is due to many reasons, being the house, the high uh, disposable income that the country has and the high population. Um, but also we have Japan and Germany as the second and third place. Now, when you're using this tool, you need to keep it in mind that it's a Google-based tool. So, for example, we have South Korea in the 26th place for that specific um, category, but... 50, more than 50% of the population in South Korea don't use Google as a search engine. So those are certain things that you need to take into consideration. Also, when entering a new client, you need to 
I also have a look at your network base. And today we're talking about Brazil and South Korea, and I'm sure we're going to have great connections at the end of this talk. So those are things that you should be taking into consideration as well. Now, after you have chosen the market that you want to enter and you're ready to go, there's a few steps that you need to take to optimize your digital presence. And um, the best way to have a presence online is through your website. And for that, you need to be taking a few steps to make sure your website is being found by your target audience in that country. And you really need to focus on creating a unique user experience for each country. I'm gonna talk briefly about five points here, but there are so many more that you could just dive into. Um, first, the site, the structure and domain structure, then the H ref tags, the language of your website, the localized contact information that you need to be having on your content the local currents and the local payment methods. Uh, so the site structure and domain structure, you need to be, you need to buy the domain that, for example, if you enter in Brazil, you need to be making sure that you're buying the .com, .br content, that it doesn't only help your search engine um, to rank your content up, but it also helps your user to trust a little bit more in your brand and buying your products. Uh, the Rahrefs tags is just a piece of code that you insert on every web page of your website that also helps Google geographically or any search engine geographically know who you're targeting, which country you're targeting. Also language, make sure your content is reading, is written by a fluent speaker of your target language. Don't rely on Google translated translation or auto translation. Even like the subtle nuances of the language uh, can really impact your ranking on when searching your product online. Make sure to add localized contact information. Um, if someone is in South Korea and wants to call you, make sure there is a call, uh, phone number and email that it's local to that country. Um, and lastly, the local currency and the local payment methods that are also things that, things that affect your ranking, but are also things that are really important for the user to trust your brand. If you're selling to Brazil, make sure you have REIs as, as a currency or even when it comes to payment methods, uh, Brazilian people, they like to pay in installments, for example. So that's a payment method that you need to make it available for the local market. And, and that goes for any other country that you want to enter. Make, be sure to be doing your research on that. Um, and now after talking a little bit about the technical side of search engine optimization, make sure the, the most important thing is to be focusing on your content as well, because that's what is going to bring you the, the high amount of um, quality traffic to your website. Uh, so make sure you're doing research of what your competitors are doing. Make sure to be speaking the language when you're creating content. Keywords is essential and you cannot just translate literally one keyword to another. You need to really work with someone that is fluent in the language. Otherwise, your content is not going to rank up. As I mentioned before, sometimes Google just isn't just all that. You, you have South Korea that use never um, as a search engine platform, you have Baidu in China, Yandex in, in Russia. So make sure you're optimizing your content based on the search engine that your audience from that country that you're choosing to target is using. And again, um, a lot of people talk about that and it's providing valuable content. So you need to be researching trends and deliver always valuable, consistent and engaging content. So just do some research, look, look what type of content is gaining traction, focus your work on that. Also, one thing very worth mentioning uh, when it comes to content creation and SEO, your network is one of the most important tools. You need to be partnering with local publishers, local online websites that can share your content to their websites and create backlinks, quality backlinks to your website, because that's what the search engines really like. Um, and, um, and one thing that I want you guys to keep in mind that ranking up on search engines is a, is a time consuming process. And there are so many things that you can be doing while you're waiting for your your content to rank that could take months. And um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about paid search and paid social advertising. Those are tools that you can be using to really test the market while 
your website is raking up. I'm using Google and Facebook as an example because they are the tools that I normally work and I am more familiar with, but they're, I mean, each country has their own social platform and their own, they own cultural considerations to take into place. Um, also, one thing that I wanted to mention that um, if you have a product that works, if you have a wide range of products and you have one specific product that works in the domestic market that is your best seller, it may not be your best seller if you're selling to Korean customers. So just keep in mind that, that you can also use those advertisings to be testing out what works the best in your targeting country. You can create different ads for different products and see the one that is gaining more traction and from that make it your decision where to spend the most of your budget at. Uh, some general tips when setting up your com campaigns, make sure you create country specific accounts. Um, it helps you stay organized, it saves you time, long term, term, long term, uh, language specific campaigns as well. Remember, um, a lot of people rely on English only when they're targeting different markets because one is it's a broadly spoken language and two is easier for them, but make sure always to focus on the domestic language. I couldn't emphasize that more with clients. Remember time zones and different currencies. Um, every country has its own behavior. It, the, the time that they pick up their children at school, the time that they go to work. So make sure you're advertising um, at the suitable timings as well. And lastly, always adapt your content. Use the right language tones, uh, the right visuals. Some countries like the ad graphics to be a bit more populated. Some countries like to be more clean. So do your research uh, based on the country that you're chosen to target. Um, and yeah, so I introduced you guys a little bit about how to find the right market, how to optimize your digital presence, and then finally how to use some advertising tools to really get you going in the targeting country. I'm leaving here my WhatsApp and my email. If you have any questions, you can just directly contact me. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. It's outstanding presentation. Very, very, very good. And now let's move to Mr. Ju. And I would like to say that I'm a Brazilian meat enthusiastic and I'm a lover of, uh, of Korean barbecue. So I would love to hear you be our guest. Okay, uh, thank you, Gabriel. Um, good morning, Bonjia, Annyeonghaseyo, all the participate participants in this uh, meeting room. And my name is Kon Young Ju. I'm uh, the sales manager of Seara Alimentos in Korea. And yeah, let's start my presentation here. Okay, before starting, um, Thank you for the previous guest speakers uh, because I found that uh, some contents are in common uh, across the presentation. So uh, thank you for doing a part of my job, <laughs> last job. Okay, speaking of myself, I'm 100% uh, born and raised in Korea. Uh, I started my career uh, in a big Korean trading company, uh, it has a corporation, and uh, I'm the first Korean employee to Seara Alimentos, not for JBS Group as a whole, but for Seara, at least for Seara, I'm uh, the first employee. Uh, and interestingly, um, not like the previous speakers, I uh, barely had any exposure to Brazilian people or Brazilian culture before working in this company. Uh, my first time talking with Brazilian people was at my job interview. <laughs> I didn't know that I'm gonna uh, have a relationship with uh, Brazilian people. Um, so yeah, so most of the uh, slides are written from the perspective of 100% local Korean. And yeah, OK, 
Okay, I'm um, starting. Let's start with the Brazilian animal protein industry. How does Brazilian industry look in the world? Simply put, Brazilian animal protein industry is big. Um, for chicken, beef, pork, most of them, uh, Brazil is only second to the US, I guess. And then in terms of exports, Brazil is always one of the top rankers around the world. And particularly for chicken, look at the chicken exports in 2019. Um, Brazil is way ahead of the competitors around the world. Simply put, again, Brazil is one of the largest or maybe the largest exporter of animal protein around the world. But interestingly, in Korea, something is not going really well. So, yeah, um, as covered in the previous uh, presentation, uh, the domestic uh, search engine, uh, Naver, which is very popular in Korea, if you look up um, Brazil top, which means Brazilian chicken on the web, and this sort of photos come out. Um, it's a little bit um, intimidating, I was intimidating, I would say, or weird, or some, some might say a little bit gross. And definitely, this is not the image we imagine of chicken or, uh, yeah, birds. So, but uh, somehow this photo uh, became the representative image of Brazilian chicken in Korea. I don't know who started this propaganda, but this is very successful in a bad way. So, basically speaking, yeah, Korean people uh, think of this image and they kind of don't like uh, very don't like it much uh, to consume this sort of birds. Uh, and this sort of uh, negative images are not only for Brazilian chicken specifically. Actually, um, Koreans are sort of um, uh, like uh, they don't, they're not really open for imported meat, uh, surprisingly. And I believe Shinto uh, Buri, which is a thought uh, that your body and your land are not two things. They should be one. And food from where you were born feature the most. So you get healthy if you eat local foods and you uh, get better. It's a it's a um, ethically right to consume domestically produced food. Uh, it's quite traditional or like a, it's a quite dominant thought for the Koreans or I would say at least when I was young I, I was a child that was like a, this sort of promotion was on the TV uh, quite frequently and this is not only for commerce but also it comes into the political area sometimes so as you can see, um, Shintoburi in commerce, they always uh, utilize this propaganda to promote the domestic products, like uh, eat Korean pork, get healthy, like uh, putting a fit guy here, and then like, uh, like promoting that you're gonna be like this guy if you eat Korean pork, which is, I wouldn't say this is 100% trustworthy, but anyways, and also putting a celebrity in traditional clothes and uh, saying give for your beloved ones, beloved family, uh, Korean pork. This kind of cliche is very common in Korea to promote uh, the domestic uh, produced, domestically food produced food, including meat. And also uh, this photo is coming from 2008 when Korea was discussing with the uh, signing the trade agreement with the United States. And back then, 
one of the most important issues were uh, importing the beef from the United States and somehow uh, the citizens perceived uh, this event as a political uh, conspiracy uh, and they thought the government is trying to introduce a uh, dangerous food in terms of biosecurity and a lot of people a lot of citizens went out to the street and gathered with uh, candles that was phenomenal back then and here as you can see uh, some people kind of protest, protest, protested in many ways like uh, uh, drawing some cartoons criticizing the government's uh, decisions. But what's the reality? Actually, uh, starting from chicken, um, of course, uh, the in industry nowadays, those are quite standardized. So of course, Korean chicken and Brazilian chicken, they are no different. They are coming from uh, one of the very few selected uh, genetics companies around the world mostly in the United States or in Brazil, Coles, Aviagen, and companies like that. And interestingly, as uh, previous speakers mentioned, uh, actually Korea depend on um, Brazil by 90% for the chicken import. So this is a total nonsense that um, such a search result come out uh, even today. And for uh, other animal proteins as well, for beef uh, and pork, blue line here, uh, the self-sufficiency level falls uh, constantly. And what is even more interesting is that for like people gathered on in the street and they protest, pr protested beef, but nowadays for 2000, as of 2021, uh, the United States is um, the dominant supplier of beef to Korea with a uh, market share above 50%. So um, in just like a dozen of years, um, now Koreans somehow fell in love with uh, the American beef. Uh, interesting, isn't it? But yeah, um, although Koreans have many meats that are uh, irrational and illogical for many times, but still I believe there are many opportunities in Korea for the food business sector, of course, because um, Koreans' passion for food is quite big um, and it's shown in many, many uh, types of events or cultures. So I think some of you may know about mukbang, which is um, basically airing uh, when airing eating, like uh, watching uh, some person eating a lot of food, a, a fancy food, a good food, whatever. As you can see, this guy is gonna taste uh, different uh, types of belly, and they're he's going to um, uh, choose the top one. And this lady here is famous for um, eating uh, a lot of food at a time. Uh, and she kind of um, makes others feel like uh, satisfied. I didn't eat anything, but I feel like I had many things uh, like, a, uh, how do I say, proxy of eating. And Matjib uh, is a must-go place, places around in Korea. So people uh, line up uh, outside of the restaurant for even for like one or two hours just to have uh, the must-have menus uh, of the time and this is quite interesting culture I, I say and in terms of meat consumption Korea is still behind Brazil or many European or Western countries 
but still compared with uh, China or Japan and other Asian countries, Korea is one of the actually the largest meat consumer in Asia. And that puts a lot of uh, uh, a lot of opportunities for meat business, of course, for other foods as well. And uh, for the two slides here, uh, I would like to present the recent market changes and the projected market changes in the near future. So, as I said, Koreans are already uh, depending on the Brazilian meat and other imported meat as well. Other than that, um, Korea is a wealthier country than most of us know or remember. So this ch this chart is uh, GDP per capita from 1990 to 2018. So for the 30 years, South Korea has risen from here to there. Now we surpass Italy and very close to Japan and United Kingdom and like uh, closing the gap with Germany. So the GDP per capita will be like somewhere between 36 or 37,000 US dollars per capita nowadays, which is quite large, I would say. And also along with the econ economic growth um, for the last several years, the minimum wage has risen very sharp. So if you see the orange uh, line here. This is the increase percent year on year. And like from 2017 to 2018, uh, it grew over uh, 15%. Like uh, a year, ha year has passed and everybody is now get paid like 17% higher for in terms of minimum wage. That actually happened in Korea, which is quite unusual. As you can see in the previous years, it was not happening that radically, but things are happening nowadays. And if I look into the industry itself, meat industry, um, the import and demand are changing, already changed. So for before 2015, the major supplier of uh, chicken chicken leg meat was the United States. And back then, the usual product of uh, the United States were whole leg, what we uh, call whole leg, uh, leg meat with bone. And then suddenly from 2015, um, Brazil became the dominant player in the, in the market. And Brazil's typical product was without bone. We call it boneless leg meat BL, but as you can see, the demand is certainly different. And I think this change is highly related to this sort of micro um, economic structure change. And projected uh, change in the near future um, with the, I would say, going economy and as the market develops, country get develops, um, there is not much of room for that emotional or irrational meets. So those sort of um, uh, misunderstandings wouldn't have much room to sustain. They will collapse and Koreans will uh, uh, awake uh, regardless of they like it or not. They need a more efficient supply, more efficient cost structure. And with the more open stands for the imported goods, uh, on the other side, labor shortage will be the key and it will sustain for the coming years as well. And actually, this is happening in Korea right now, and it's mostly concentrated in 3D jobs, what we call uh, dirty, uh, difficult, dangerous kind of things. And this is not only about the cost of the labor, actually, regardless of how much the entrepreneur will pay, there is simply not many people who want to do such a job. So simply put, 
Koreans no longer want to live on 3D jobs. And this is the minimum wage across the countries, uh, by country, and South Korea stands here. And I would say the biggest opportunity lies in between the wage difference uh, of the countries. I believe the South Korea will uh, demand certain things from the countries from here, including Brazil. And Brazil may benefit Korea by uh, uh, providing uh, value-added and labor-added products and services. And that's about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much, Mr. Ju. It's an outstanding presentation. Very nice work that you're doing um, in Korea. So I have to pass the word to Sue because we are already over time. But before to do that, I'd like to invite you guys to write your comments, do your questions here in the in the chat. Afterwards, we can we can we can make the the, the questions for everybody. And by the end here, I would like to thank you everyone for listening to this panel. Uh, thank you for the panelists, Mr. Vitor Melão, Thiago Matos, Ms. Julia Mazocchi, and Mr. Ju. I think you, we started here with the right foot. And you guys, I can say you guys from the previous experience of this panel and of this event, you guys set the, the bar very high here and very interesting the way that you guys are working two countries. Thank you so much. And so please uh, um, take the word with you and lead us for the next panel. Uh, we have the, our moderator is Gabriel Stanton. Uh, is tax, he's tax lawyer from South Korea Advogados and head of South Korea Startup Hub. We have, uh, so I will um, pass the word to Gabriel. Uh, I would like to ask everybody to just to be more um, careful with our time because we would like to finish this event uh, in uh, within 30 minutes. Thank you so much. So good night and good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you, Sue, for the, the kind invitation and greet everyone who is following us from all around the world. Uh, it is such a pleasure being here today to moderate this panel of entrepreneurship and innovation investors. Also, uh, I have to say that we could not be happier with the lineup of speakers and their engagement to discuss such an interesting subject and share their knowledge and experience. Of course, innovation and investment uh, have been in the spotlight for the past years, especially considering the growing number of unicorns, IPOs and investments. Um, as Sue mentioned, I am a tax lawyer and head of our startup hub, and we have been facing a lot of innovative projects uh, for the past years, such like cryptocurrencies, equity crowdfunding, fintechs, and health techs. And so, due to the time control, I will pass the word to our first speaker, uh, Mr. Caetano Altafin. Caetano is founder and CEO at Woof, GoF.pat from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and he will talk about the latest trends on pet tech and the future of the pet industry. Caetano, the word is yours. Thank you much, Gabriel, and thank you, Sue, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to talk to you tonight and this morning in Seoul about pet tech and about the future and what the future expects for us in the pet industry. Um, so you should be seeing a few cute dogs uh, right now. Uh, so basically, you know, uh, if you ask someone um, from South Korea, perhaps from IPL, how the future of the pet industry looks like, you'll probably see something like this. Okay, no video then. Uh, no worries at all. So I'll just do here in the fast forward. I'm not sure why this is not, you know, displaying as it should. Well, that's a feeling. But anyway, so here was just a video about a robot, you know, really cute robots, you know, kind of pretending uh, he was or it was a dog. And here, if you ask folks from, you know, Boston Dynamics, 
which have different types of robots, you see different types of robots, of course, but you won't see real pets. Uh, and here was basically you know, uh, a, a show in Black Mirror, you know, showing those cute dogs from Boston Dynamics actually going for it and actually killing the humans that had them before. Uh, but basically, if you ask myself, you know, how the future of pet tech looks like, um, is actually the present, how the present looks like. And pets really became more and more part of our family. So they left the backyard uh, a few years ago. They became part of our lifestyle. And now they're a central part of our family. So basically, if you come to my place during Christmas time, this is a picture you see, you know, a bunch of dogs and cats all over the place. Uh, so these are our daily lives. Uh, and basically, this changed the way we perceived our pets in our lives. So basically, as a result of that, not yet because of the robots and not even the killing robots from Netflix, um, <laughs> the pet industry has been growing remarkably across the globe. Uh, see the U.S. pet industry uh, now is more than 100 billion U.S. dollars. Brazil is the third largest market in the globe with $7 billion being spent every year on pets. Uh, and what surprises, and this is, surprises me, uh, even with COVID, you see that at least in Brazil, only 5% of the industry uh, happens through digital channels, meaning that there is a sub-penetration on online, say, online channels, meaning that there's a lot of growth yet to happen there. Uh, and basically, uh, you know, base, you know the, the pet owners, they still concentrate a lot of their expenditure in products. So things that their pets need on a daily basis. Pet tech by itself, so the robots and IoT and all the, the fancy stuff that I'll explain to you in a little while uh, is expected to hit more than $27 billion by 2027. So a lot to happen there for sure. Uh, so the way I see is that in general, excluding robots, uh, people are looking for real life solution for what their pet needs meaning information that drives products and services sale. So people are looking for meaningful information and for products that actually transform the way their pets eat into pet care. So the closely you are with respect to taking care of their pets as a family member, this is where everyone is targeting. And I'll explain what my vision in that respect in a little while. So before we had a one-size-fits-all solution in the pet industry, then you had an all-to-everyone, meaning that there's a lot, you know, like, for example, in an average pet online pet shop in Brazil, you see more than 30,000 products are actually looking for a needle, trying to do what is best for your pet. Now, and this is where we're moving forward, uh, we have all-to-you, meaning that there's a lot of information, a lot of AI that I think will drive consumption of pet products, focusing on creating a pet-centric experience. On the other hand, people, they want to connect with one another based on common interests. So I see that there's a lot of cross-selling to happen with respect to people that love cats, people that love dogs, and people that love dogs, and they want to bring their dogs with them when they go for a weekend in a special place. So you're really looking for a place that will make you and your family, including your dog, feel welcome. So there's a lot of cross selling to happen in that respect. With COVID, all of that just became stronger. So instead of traveling, buying cars, going for bars and dancing, except for the Phantom of Opera, of course, uh, in South Korea, people were spending, they started to spend more at their homes with their pets, with takeaway uh, and, and solutions and online shopping. And this is a trend that came to stay. Chewy, which is the largest retailer in the US is an example of that. Its market price, its market cap went above 40, 40 billion US dollars. Uh, and now it went a little bit down um, because of, you know, we'll discuss that in a little while, but basically pets never have been so important in our daily lives. Uh, pet tax funding has been growing year after year. I'm not going through that. Uh, these, you know, start to give me my vision on that. And this goes back to when Chewy, uh, was bought by PetSmart in 2017 before going public. Uh, and this, in short, you're making a long story short, my view is that uh, clients or pet owners, they want a place that, are, that, that is assertive to what their pet needs, meaning that 
general too broad experiences like Amazon or Mercado Livre in Brazil or B2W, they don't provide a pet centric experience. And that's what consumers are looking for. They want to provide their pets with what's best for them. So too broad, too general experiences do not do the, they don't do the trick anymore. Uh, WEG. WEG is a good example of a pet services platform that tries to scale what I call, at least by this moment, a non-scalable business, which is services. If you want to walk your dog, this is not something you don't put your kid in a sit in a seat belt and give that kid to the Uber driver to deliver somewhere. This is actually actually what happened with WAG. This dog is called Wendy. Uh, it unfortunately got you know killed when it was being walked by a walker from WAG, uh, and this resulted in a three hundred million uh, dollar write off from SoftBank's Vision Fund. I mean that it's hard to scale every business, particularly when that business don't match with where the market is going. Again, pets became part of the families. You don't put a baby or a dog in someone's, someone else's hands, someone you don't really trust, or you know, there's a, an element that doesn't help scaling that business model. IoT. IoT is yet to be developed. There's a lot of IoT going on in the pet industry. You see cameras, you see colors, you see a bunch of things, but there's a lot to be, you know, be developed there. Uh, so this is yet to be to come. Uh, and again, I think this will grow and solutions will get better. Um, growth is one thing, profitability is another. This is two is 10K from 2020, meaning that even, even having a 40 billion US dollar market cap, QE has never given one US dollar of profit, uh, has never, never been profitable. So e commerce is a fair business. So I think there are smarter ways to deliver pet products to folks at home. And to provide clients with a pet-centric experience, which for me is Chewy's, you know, most remarkable quality. Uh, so where where are we going? I think people will start to look for more efficient ways to sell pet products. This is exactly what we at Wolf we are doing in Brazil. Services will have to be reinvented using technology. So I see that there's a lot of things that will change there. For us, the approach that in the future, once we become as as Wolf an ecosystem, we will use the community elements to try to bring services back within the, the IT space, but it's something yet to be developed. I, AI and IoT, I think they have a lot to develop. We at Wolf, we're doing a lot of AI, especially, but we're starting to, again, creating this pet-centric experience that will make ourselves different than generic marketplaces. Pet food is not pet food. Pet food will start more and more to be seen as pet nutrition as part of the pet health. Uh, and pet insurance and vet tech uh, is yet to be developed. I think there's a lot changing, especially because of COVID. So you see, you know, veterinarians changing the way their profession works, you know, pet insurance growing and growing because again, pets became part of the family. So as we are migrating, and this I think to sum up, the robots are super cool and unfortunately i could not show them to you but i encourage you to take a look at the boston dynamics robots uh, i wouldn't replace i wouldn't change my dog for for you know a boston dynamics robot i would it, it, it would be quite scary for me but in any event i think I, I think that the ones that will disrupt this industry will be those that transform services and products into pet care because we're really looking after we're really taking taking care of pets as family members. So thank you very much for your time this evening and this morning. It has been a pleasure being part of this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Caetano. So Sue, uh, due to the time control, I'll pass over to you. This is a very, very interesting subject and I think we will have a second round next year. So thank you all the speakers, Sue, please. So thank you so much for all the speakers of the panel three. Uh, Michael, Patrus, Pacus, Caetano, and Stella, and moderator Gabriel, thank you so much for your contribution. So, guys, uh, we are uh, at the end of the event. Uh, I have two uh, guests to do closing remarks before we finish our uh, uh, event. So, I will invite Paulo Funchal in sequence, Caio. So, Paulo, please. Good evening, after, afternoon to everyone, depends on where you are. 
My name is Paulo Funchal and I am the founding partner of Zed Partners, Integrated Strategic Planning Consultancy. First of all, I'd like to thank Sujun Ko very much for her initiative. I do believe that business development is only possible when it's supported by a knowledge culture and sharing is the most efficient way to achieve this objective. Also, one of the characteristics of the new global culture is the network society, which brings a fundamental change in the social structure where the importance of place is secondary to the importance of flows. And I'm sure this lecture series were able to embrace these both concepts, a network society driven by a knowledge culture, supporting continuous improvement and learning. So I just want to say congratulations to all. Thank you. Caio? I would like to thank you, Sue, for the invitation and also for all the speakers today. It was a very interesting event with a lot of speakers bringing some experience from different areas of knowledge and bringing to us an international network and also a high level association when we can learn more about uh, different ranges of possibilities in, the, in the entrepreneurship and also uh, different levels of cooperation between Brazil and Korea. So thank you so much on behalf of PG Law, the law firm that I represent here. I am associated in the corporate M&A practice of PG Law and also uh, on behalf of the Center of Asian Legal Studies at the University of Sao Paulo, which is committed to develop the engagement of the dialogue between Brazil, especially the academia, and also the Asian countries. So thank you so much again for the opportunity and the privilege to be here. Thank you, Caio. So finally, we uh, we were able to achieve our goal. Uh, it's a 10.42 p.m. Sao Paulo time. So again, uh, I'd like to finish this event by saying how grateful I am to be able to uh, host this uh, uh, Korea Brazil uh, uh, entrepreneurship lecture series every year since 2016. Uh, so Again, uh, thank you so much for your contribution, your participation and attention to these events. Uh, let's hope that everybody gets very uh, safe from coronavirus and uh, starting next year, we can travel uh, abroad, go to Korea, and we can also invite uh, the communities from Korea to Brazil and, and US, vice versa. So let's connect and learn, uh, learn each other, uh, learn from each other, help each other. And so, Again, uh, on behalf of everybody, the organization, institutional support and partners, uh, I would like to uh, finalize this uh, nine um, edition of Brazil Korea Entrepreneurship Lecture Series. Um, congratulations to the speakers and congratulations to the audience who stayed with us uh, up to now and have a beautiful night uh, for the pe for people in Brazil and, and in, in the US and good morning for those who are in South Korea. Bye bye, guys. Uh, thank you. Bye. <laughs>